Hi, this is lecture five of marketing analytics. This lecture, we are going to look into price and promotion, um, revisiting the uh, definitions of price elasticity and pricing research, promotion evaluation, market response modeling. Now, for this particular lecture, we want to first understand how pricing research produces marketing uh, data for marketing decisions and how marketing decisions are derived from attribute combination using conjoint analysis and also how promotional research provides marketing data for marketing decisions. Now, in any pricing research, we must understand that pricing is the only element in the marketing mix that will always generate revenue. The question, of course, is at what optimum price should we set for our products and services? So pricing research is about predicting absolutes. A lot of majority of research projects, of course, other than pricing studies, answer questions of a relative nature, which cause for them estimates are sufficient. But in pricing, it's very different. For example, which product formulation do people like more? when it comes to new product development? Or can we identify groups who are more likely to buy our product? Which attributes is our brand more associated with? For example, like mapping of image studies. But pricing studies are really about predicting what is that one value that will be the soft, sweet spot for people to actually want to buy our product, okay? Another example would be which influences uh, brand choice are more important in terms of usage and attitude and of course brand studies. So when we talk about pricing uh, research predicting absolutes, we're actually talking about pricing research must be reflecting the real world in terms of absolute projections and demands or even the changes in the demands. Because realism in pricing research is therefore all important to establishing the revenues that we are going to project to have, and of course the budgeting that we are going to pump in to ensure our products is a success. So the researcher must have a very clear understanding of the price influences on the decision process in order to replicate those uh, influences in this research design. Okay, so if you look at this particular pricing research methods, on the column side, you have the conditions of measurements, whether it can be controlled or experimentally controlled. And the variables measured on the row side are actual pricing behaviors that will happen, but you also have the claimed, which means people say what they prefer, what are their intentions and what their attitudes. So in terms of controlled and actual purchases, we definitely can see people going in and out of a store and we can track their buying behavior through consumer loyalty panel data or even the store scan. In an experimentally controlled, we can, of course, set one particular place to have certain discounts or maybe we inflate the price and it's like, like, like a laboratory purchase experiment. But in terms of preferences and claims, we have the buyer response surveys like the Gabber Granger and also the Van, Van Den, West Endorp price sensitivity meter, which we're going to explain a little bit. But in an environmentally controlled environment, we need to see whether or not that uh, if we give them certain choices or certain price uh, 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 um, uh, combinations, if they are going to purchase these particular products. So it's like brand price trade-off or conjoint analysis and even discrete choice models. Yeah. So historical data for existing brands and you have the econometrics and the stimulated market tests, but in the blue color uh, ellipses, you notice that it's all about the psychological approaches to pricing and it's always done at. Now, 
pricing, of course, will demand the sales. Increases in prices results in decrease in baseline sales. In most of the time, when price gets too high, people will tend not to buy. So as you can see from this graph, that the demand in volume actually drops when the price actually goes up. Notice the two uh, very different arrows going up and down. Yep. So in a, um, uh, 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 sorry, a, a, a market where we just want to gauge the responses from the uh, consumers in terms of pricing, we can use the Gerber-Granger price method. Now, the Gerber-Granger price method is just basically a very simple and speedy technique that provides fair rough estimates on how people will respond to a change in the price. So price hikes due to either policy or circumstances, of course, may lead to sharp fall in the demand, but successive price hike adjustments could bolster consistent demand uh, by making sure that the consumers are climatized. So this is where you also have to not think about how much you're going to raise the prices, but you must also think about how often you are going to raise the prices and in what ranges so that you have a climatization for the buyers so that they don't feel the pinch in the price ray, uh, hike uh, too much that they would be put off. So this must be, be in congruence with competitors and it must be done with very much research and also the finger on the pulse as it were for the consumers. Now, it doesn't take the buyer price sensitization in competitive scenario into account, unfortunately, because you don't know whether the buyers are going to be responding positively. You only have the uh, pricing uh, and the attitude towards whether they will buy or not buy. Because in some cases, most of the consumers will say that they will buy, even if they're loyal to the brand. But when it push comes to shove, they will not buy if let's say they don't have the money to spend. Then you also have what we call the Van Westendorp price sensitivity meter. Now in the Van Westendorp price sensitivity meter, there is this thing called the range of acceptable prices, whereby you ask four questions posed to respondents. At what price on this scale would you consider the product or service to be, firstly, a bargain, which means that it is inexpensive, price so cheaply that you would question its quality or it becomes way too cheap. Price expensively, that means the price that you pay for the value is really, really not uh, favorable. Or the price is so expensively that you would not buy it at all. So it is within the range of acceptable prices that you are trying to buy. So is it too expensive, which is the red line? too cheap, which is the blue line, expensive, which is the red dotted line, or cheap, which is the blue line. So here is the sweet spot or the optimum value where you should be pricing your particular product or services using this method. And then, of course, there is the price elasticity. Now, you know that price elasticity uh, deals with the changes in the prices to look at what is the changes in the demand. So change in the quantity over the change in the price will give you the price elasticity demand, which is, as you can see, the percentage of change in sales and the percentage of change in price. Uh, you will get the ratio of the relative change uh, of volume due to the relative change in the price. So how does pricing change uh, affect the demand of the particular product. So the price elasticity looks at a very simple thing. When you are able to draw a demand curve, if you notice that when you raise the price at 33% in this particular example, then your demand can contract by 50% using just the graph to show where the demand curve lies. So from four to two, if you raise the price from 3,000 to 4,000. So this is also a very good method to look at what is the optimum pricing that we should be looking at. 
A profit curve and pricing decision also means what price should we sell our product. So for example, if you have the current price that fluctuates from one end to the other end, when it becomes too expensive, your demand and profit will drop. But if you have the share of your volume going down, then you know that your max profit that you can achieve for a particular uh, product is the tip of the curve before the profit goes down. And then, as you can see, the price increases, your volume and share also decreases. So think about finding an optimum range of where you want to see your price as well as the demand coming together. Now, what is the optimum price? You know, you should ask yourself about all these other things, whether it's promotional or regular pricing, profit, revenue share, competitive scenario and ratios, and also determine the threshold price from the offering attributes. Now, the conjoint analysis can give you a very good look into this. So how can conjoint analysis helps you with the positioning, especially in terms of pricing? See, the purpose of the conjoint analysis is to find out which characteristics is important, which level of the characteristics is the most preferred, and which combination is the most, including the price. The premise is that the whole of its sum of its parts is better than when you're looking into different different sections of the attribute together. So we can infer the relative importance of parts from the customer preference on the whole. Now, for example, if let's say we have a sign a value of 1 to 100 to these options, 100 being the most likable and 1 being the least likable, which of these particular televisions would you buy? Would you buy a Sony, which is priced very, very high, but of course of very good quality, an LG, which is priced very, very cheaply, or a Panasonic, which is priced somewhere mid-range, but of course it is LCD and not plasma. So you are basically trying to ask your respondents to pick out which of the combination of attributes they most likely will buy, as well as what is the attributes that are most important to them when they are making a product purchase decision. Now, Conducting a conjoint analysis would be, first you have to decide what are the attributes and the levels. For example, what are the characteristics that you're looking at? And if let's say you're looking at the levels, how many levels would you go? Now, I would suggest not to go beyond three levels because it can get a little bit complicated. Um, if let's say you're going for colors, try to stick to maybe just three colors. Then you design an orthogonal design to lower down the number of combinations because if you're going to look at all the combinations, it will be too difficult for you and too much for you to analyze. Get the respondents to rate the preference on these combinations which you have decided and then select the conjoint analysis procedure and then interpret the results. So I'm going to give you an example here where you look at the attributes of sole, upper and price for a shoe and then three levels for each of the attributes with all the descriptions. Now, for a much more in-depth look into this particular example, please watch my technical video on conjoint analysis for um, attribute, uh, um, uh, 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 attribute um, uh, determinations, right? Uh, conjoint analysis for attribute combinations. So this is where you create the orthogonal designs, where you have nine cards. Each card represents a combination of a particular shoe attribute combination, right? So you have nine different sets of combinations, just from three attributes and three levels of each attributes alone. And this is even not all the attributes. Yeah, if you really want to look at it, it should be at least about three to the power of three, which is about 27 cards. But here we're only dealing with nine. Now, for each of the nine, we ask the combination, uh, we ask the respondents to place their preferences from one to five, one being the least preferred and five being the most preferred on every single one of those combinations. And then we analyze in terms of their path worth in terms of highest utility for the sole, 
for the upper and for the price. And you notice that in terms of the highest utility, you have sole, you have canvas, and you have $90. But in terms of the attribute combination, which is the most preferred combo, you will notice that if you take the means of all the cards, you will see that combo number three and combo number five is actually the most preferred combo because if you look at 3.9 in terms of the mean and 3.9 in terms of the mean, which is the highest in comparison with all the other nine cards. And the least preferred is card number four or the attribute combination number four, whereby it is not so high in terms of its mean. Now you can also do this by increasing the variance of maybe not just 1 to 5, maybe you can put it at 1 to 10, then get a little bit more variance out of that. Now, after understanding about pricing, now we have to move on to promotion. Now, promotion can be done in many, many different forms. You can have price off, refunds, rebates, bonus packs, premiums, and so on and so forth, contact sampling, and, and more. Now, Think about doing cooperative advertisements of price off and in-store. Now, if let's say you want to do cooperative, it could be bundling and it could be selling more volume at a cheaper price. Like for example, in 1999, there was a May Day sales or co-op sales of higher than the rest of the year sales for Pepsi. So it's just one time off, you sell everything in a big bundle. Sometimes promotion can pick up its intensity, especially during festive season. You notice that when festive season comes around, more and more promotion actually happens because they're trying to entice more people to buy more. But soft drinks, let's say if you take the example of it, the promotion period, let's say if we look at Chinese New Year, the volume definitely goes up, but the price of these goes down because if you're using cooperative uh, uh, purchasing, then more bulk means less price per product, but it allows people to buy more and therefore you get more gain. So you also need to think about when is the best time to do cooperative uh, promotions like this. Right? For example, the sales of the 24 pack of major soft drinks, price goes down to encourage you to buy more and therefore the volume of sales go up. You might also want to think about a tactic of using collectible class promos to help generate interest, maybe in the Coca-Cola brand or even its legacy, a one-time off thing. Some people use retail stores to present uh, unparalleled opportunity to influence shopper behavior like using visually stimulating uh, or other sensors, digital, uh, the way that they do sampling, the way that they do the uh, stacking up of their uh, um, products as well. So this is also a way. In-store promotional strategy. Now consider these things. How do you craft a good promotional strategy by defining promotional objectives? The professional or profitable promotions are the factors that you need to consider when you're planning your strategy. Understand that your credit category and the role of the promotions within it. Promotions also in terms of relation to price. Now you don't want to have too big of a promotion, especially if you're doing it for a luxury item. You also need to see the market and you also need to evaluate the situation. So why do we promote? We promote because we're trying to do all these things. Increase new customers by increasing penetration, increase loyalty of existing customer. Sometimes you might have surplus volume of stock you want to get rid of. Persuade retailers to support in-brand store. Compensate for price increases. If let's say there are a certain brand that increase price, then maybe another brand can decrease the price. Uh, you want to persuade retailers to list the brand so that people see that there are people buying. Therefore, more brands will be listed and your consumers will have more options. You're trying also to defend against competitor activity. Now, you may also want to use tactics like promotion evaluation. Now, promotion evaluations, you need to look at a few things. Firstly, look at timing. Can certain timing be better for promotions? Do you promote things during low season? 
or do you promote things during high season? For example, if you take, for example, Christmas, what do you normally want to promote during Christmas? Obviously, you might want to promote more candy, you might want to promote more Christmas ornaments during Christmas, and so on and so forth, uh, as opposed to other times. The intensity. Does the same intention, uh, intense promotion result in the same gains as other SKUs? Now, if you want to, let's say, promote a new product, for example, will this new product get uh, the same sales as all the other SKUs or will it get more as uh, more sales uh, as compared to the other SKUs because are you is your intention to generate sales or to uh, uh, introduce the product you might also want to think about cannibalization now if you intensely promote one particular product above the other then you might kill another brand Think about the gain. What is the historic volume and gain of this particular product? And was it worth it to do the promotion for this particular Now, this is just a very big graph to show you how promotions calendar is done for a major brand. Now, if you notice that promotions are done usually in Chinese New Year, right? January to early February, and then maybe somewhere around Christmas. Yeah. But if you notice that the volume that has gained was more successful during Chinese New Year, but not during Christmas. So find out why this happened. Discovering cannibalization is a way for you to look at the sales decomposition, right? So imagine you've got four different brands here. Look at what is the base sales that would have occurred if without any in-store activity. Now, this of course includes promoted sales that would have incurred, uh, sorry, occurred without the promotion. So as long as it's status quo, how much uh, well has this particular product has been done? Then you might want to think about if you were to increase the in-store activity or maybe the media for promotion, then will there be incremental sales, okay? But, if let's say you don't do anything, but your other brand does more sales, then you might also want to think about the loss of the sales. And this is where you know and track cannibalization has happened. So you can decompose your sales by looking at these three uh, different sections of uh, the pricing or sales activity. So now the question is, has your brand gained as a result of the promotion, volume, value, and profit. Looking at these three different cases of a hypothetical product, right? We see that there is the pricing of the regular case one, two, and three, right? And we notice that the pricing now has given a discount. Okay, so we note that case number three has the highest discount, but it has the mid price. Sorry, uh, it has the lowest price, right? But case number one has the lowest discount, but it has the mid price. But case number two has the uh, mid discount, but the higher price. So what has this ha done to So if you notice, case number one with its pricing um, has not gained enough profit, but it has gained some form of value and some form of prof, uh, some form of volume. Okay. In terms of case number three, where you gave the highest discount you did not see profits, it got wiped out, although you saw a good increase of volume and value. Whereas case number two is still holding on, but still there was a dip in the profit. So now the question is, what should you be looking into? Again, look at your objective. If your objective is about making profits, 
then try not to put too much of a discount. But if your intention is to get rid of volume, make sure that you are getting rid of stock, then maybe set the discount a little bit lower, even though this is not important to you at all. Learn to rationalize your promotion plans. That's important. Weed out the less effective promotions. That means don't do it all the time. And always go back to your successful examples and repeats. So in terms of market response modeling and promotions evaluations, here are some things that you can do. Firstly, try to model the discount elasticity. Measure the responsiveness of the sales demand quantity due to a temporary change in price. Next, you might want to think about cannibalization. When drop prices for a particular product, what is increase in the advertising and then improving product quality or expanding the distribution? Did, if it cannibalized the competing products, then the cross elasticity of the demand is the measure of those competitive effects. So there are many, many effects that come into play. You might also want to think about the effects of display and cooperative advertisements. What is the impact of all this in-store activity in terms of the percentage increase in sales volume due to the incidence of marketing effort? You might also want to then break down the sales comp decomposition and look at the baseline of each factor of the driving sales and also whether or not sales is attributed to other in-store activity or just the status quo alone. Then think about what if analysis, investigating the impact of the marketing mix on components of sales. If you increase the distribution, if you were to increase the promotion, if you had more choices of products, or if you change the pricing, how is that going to affect your sales? So some of the key takeaways I like you to note for this particular lecture is pricing research is all about the balance of price and attributes of an offering that will be desirable to a buyer. So again, you might want to look at what is the perception of people who would likely want to buy a particular product given the set of attributes that you have set for them. Then you can find out the analysis of this using conjoint analysis. Number two, you might want to think about the price elasticity. Control the price fluctuations according to the demands. Do not fluctuate your price too much because your demand will be very sensitive, but always make sure that you check. Determine the objectives of your promotion. Why do you do the promotion? Consider the timing, the tactic, and of course the intensity, gains and profits and loss. Volume, uh, uh, your gains, as well as your profits and also think about the cannibalization effect of your promotion. Now, for this tutorial, for this lecture, I would like you to explore conjoint analysis using the case of the uh, shoe data set that I've given you following this particular technical video which I've created. So go through it and uh, play around and study how to do conjoint analysis using attribute combination uh, using conjoint analysis. And then I want you to read the article Understanding Luxury Shopping Destination Preference using conjoint analysis. And I need you to explain to me after reading the article, what are the challenges would there be for intangible services to accurately perform conjoint analysis? and then try to figure out what are some of the tactics that can be placed in terms of handling these uh, challenges, especially for intangible products, which is like services. So that concludes this lecture. For the next lecture, we're gonna look at more of the product assortment, and we're gonna look at category management and how place space management is going to play a lot in terms of our distribution. So thank you very much and take care.